right, we're speaking today <clears throat> two candidates for the District 1 County Commission seat, Al Abatello and Jim Johns. Welcome to you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank so, you. Uh, welcome to St. Augustine Record. Uh, we'll start with a two-part question, if you don't mind. The first part of the question is, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. And then the second part is, why are you running for District Seat 1? Okay. So we'll start with Mr. Okay. Abatello, if you don't mind. Yeah, great. Now, I'm Al Abatello, and I live in Fruit Cove, a northwest part of St. John's County. And uh, I've been here for the last 18 years, moved from St. Louis, Missouri originally from Chicago, Illinois, and we moved here because of the ambiance, the quiet, the, 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 uh, all the, the history of St. John's County. Uh, plus, as a realtor, we were also recommended highly that this was the place to move, simply because of resale values and things of that nature. So, obviously, we moved to St. John's County, and we have not regretted it since, okay? Uh, I've spent, like I said, 18 years in St. John's County, and from that uh, original, uh, the time I moved here, we have been involved uh, really uh, heavily in St. John's County um, um, issues, and the same highway, uh, the bridge crossing, and things of that nature. That uh, and uh, residents uh, in that northwest area frequently come to myself as well as my wife, uh, looking for um, advice on things that are happening within the county, or at least information on what's happening in St. John's County. So. So we've been heavily involved in St. John's County for years and years and years, okay? And of course, some of the major issue, primarily the major issue has always been growth, and it's uh, never stopped in the last 18 years. So these, this is some of the reasons why we're here. I have uh, three, uh, three children, two, they're all grown, uh, two daughters and uh, one son, had some grandchildren and so forth. And uh, I decided to run for county commission because uh, we, we really do have uh, some major concerns as far as the growth is concerned, okay, and, and the fact that the um, uh, uh, the county commission continues to uh, approve uh, communities and uh, residential communities uh, despite the fact that we have simply like 70,000 homes that still have not yet been built uh, and at the current rate of uh, 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 permitting, we're looking at 25 to 30 years of uh, continued growth. As it turns out, uh, the Northwest, which has been the heavily po populated area, I'm sorry, the heavily uh, impacted area as far as development is concerned, we're seeing uh, uh, problems with roads as are happening throughout the entire county. And um, we're seeing uh, other issues related to the environment uh, and things that, uh, you know, scenic and historic <coughs> issues that are uh, actually disappearing. So my primary concern is that we want to preserve some of this history of St. John's County and of the character of St. John's County, which is rapidly disappearing. And as chairman of the William Barkham Santa Highway for the last uh, 10 years, uh, that's been our focus, and uh, fighting against uh, encroaching development that impacts the roadway. So those are, you know, we could continue, but uh, so I'll stop there. <laughs> thank you. Very much. Well, first, thank you for the time and the opportunity to educate the voting population. I think that's very important that people need to take into consideration who is up for election mm -hmm. and what they stand for so that we can make sure that we meet the population's needs as a commissioner. I was raised in the area, graduated from Jacksonville University with a degree in physics and a degree in engineering from the University of Florida through a dual degree program. I went to work for International Paper Company in Louisiana where I was resp responsible for the Clean Air, Clean Water Act compliance uh, as I moved my way through the ranks. Uh, very much enjoyed it, keep in touch with people that I worked with that, at that time. Got the chance to move back here in 2000. I brought my family and like everybody else, we looked at schools and crime rates and quality of life and chose Julian Creek Plantation to move to. It's a very different world now than it was growing up here. At that time when I grew up, you could send the kids out Saturday morning and say, come back by dark. <laughs> Wonderful opportunity for growing. At that time, St. Augustine was seen as that smaller county south of Duval, very rural, uh, nice place, uh, still beautiful, but it has evolved over time. We are now number one in so many different aspects that the rest of the state and the country aspires to be more like we are. Between education, healthiest communities, lowest crime rates, we are a place that people recognize as attractive and a place that they want to live. Therefore, we are having to manage that demand for people wanting to move here. We're either going to manage growth or decline. We're never stagnant. There is no Mayberry where nobody grows old and everybody's always employed and everything's self-sustaining. Self 
So we have to manage the resources that we have. We have some of the highest percentage of natural resources between wetlands, waterways, conservation areas, as a percentage of our county compared to other counties in our state. And I'm very conscious that we need to maintain that. As we change, as we grow, I want to make sure that we maintain the special qualities about our county that attracted people here in the first place. I, I joke with people that say, if you don't want our place to grow, wreck our school system, raise our crime rates, and people will no longer want to come here. Now, of course, I'm joking because we, nobody wants that, mm -hmm. but that's the challenge to the growth. I want to, be, to continue to be your commissioner because I like to be involved in the community I live in. Growing up here and continuing <coughs> to do so, I'm involved in the Rotary Club, Habitat for Humanity, Jacksonville Chamber, local chamber, uh, and many other organizations through my church. <coughs> I like to be involved. I like to know what's happening around me and more than just 24 hours ahead of any given day. I like to give back to the community. I think every one of us can agree that we've had help at one time or another to get to where we are. I like to be able to help people achieve their goals. I like to help people find answers to questions. I didn't apply to be a commissioner because I wanted to be on TV. I didn't want to say, look at me, look at what I'm doing. It was simply a matter of being involved in the community and helping people find answers to their questions. I hope that people will see what I've done in the past 15 months and recognize that by going from county, from district to district, once a month in a different district each month from six to eight o'clock with open meetings, that I am involved in the community. I am hearing what's important to people. Our county is very different. Each quadrant is like a unique jewel on a necklace. They have special qualities that attracted people to St. Augustine, to Ponte Vedra, to Julian Creek, to Hastings, and many places in between. I want as much as possible to keep those special qualities the same while we continue to adjust for the people that want to move here because of the wonderful opportunities that we have. I want to employ people in our county. Our commercial growth rate compared to our residential growth rate is way out of whack. We cannot sustain the quality of life on the backs of residents. We've got to have commercial and industrial development that is a place to employ our community that we want to patronize that's clean. We have so many industries here. I, growing up here, didn't realize how many places that we had that are multi-hundred employment opportunities. They're quiet, they're clean, and they provide a great uh, career path for people and job stability and home stability. I want to continue that. I want to make sure that the tax base is here that provides for the expectations of the quality of life of our community. You know, can I add something here? I mean, all of this is well and good, uh, you know, what uh, Jimmy has suggested, and the fact that, you know, he likes to talk to people, he likes to hear from people, he likes to... Uh, but the fact of the matter is there has to be some action also, and what we've seen from the Board of County Commissioners is approval of continual, continually approving developments, comprehensive plan changes, uh, and uh, land development codes, and, and that is what really has to stop. All of that in the past has created what we have today, and that is shortage of cash. We have a big backlog of uh, inventory that has to be corrected in terms of road uh, construction, road availability. We're having gridlock on our roads, and all of this is caused by uh, construction, okay? And so we talk about the imbalance of commercial versus residential. That continues. Uh, years ago, when I first moved here, 18 years ago, the ratio of commercial to uh, uh, residential was, uh, we had about 11% uh, commercial and everything else. Okay. Well, that has remained very static, okay? And the fact that, so we're not catching up on the commercial aspect of what it is we want. Where are our corporate headquarters? Yeah, we have a lot of storefronts and we have a lot of uh, commercial spaces of that type, but where are the uh, 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 well-paying uh, positions of corporate type headquarters. Now that might change with the uh, gate development that is coming up uh, at 9B. But you know what? <coughs> I've been involved in the community forever, okay? For the last 18 years, virtually every community activity that is uh, that comes up, uh, I am involved with. The, the radio system for St. John's County was something that I was intimately involved with of, as an advisor, number one, and two, as someone who wrote a, uh, a guest editorial for the St. Augustine Record, which changed the people's minds, I believe, on um, the value of that radio system for the health, safety, welfare of the people and the 
uh, uh, first responders of St. John's County. Uh, the bridge crossing, for instance, at uh, the St. John's River with the tollway. My wife and I, we were much involved in that. In fact, the county commission and I have, at my own expense, went out and did, did an overlay map to present to the county commission at a joint meeting with uh, the uh, Clay County uh, co uh, commissioners, and we were able to demonstrate how d the alternate routes that the FDOT was uh, uh, suggesting as being the lowest cost was actually going to impact with St. John's County with the highest cost because we were able to show with this uh, map overlay, which I have here. Uh, that was going to cross over all, virtually all of the new developments that were recently approved by the county commission. This was stunning to the commission at that point in time, and if you care to look up the video from Clay County, you'll see it. They didn't know that uh, those roadways were going to impact those communities that had just recently been approved. One of them being Rivertown, another one being Silverleaf, and uh, I think uh, there was Ashford Mills at the time also. So I've been actively involved, uh, along with uh, on the scenic highway, uh, preserving the quality of life that we have along the scenic highway. And I think uh, a lot of you may have driven up and down that roadway and uh, marveled at the ambiance and the, the scenic history that we have there. You know, as chairman, we, uh, and that's what we've been trying to protect. Uh, recently, there was a, uh, a subdivision called. Um, um, Boys Landing that had four separate quadrants of that community. Each quadrant had to get onto uh, State Road 13 in order to get to the other one or into their amenity center. And that created, uh, would have created major issues, self safety issues as well. Well, that got defeated traded too, but Commissioner Johns and I think it was Rachel Bennett approved it or at least uh, voted for it. Well, it got denied and that was, uh, we were grateful for that. And the same thing is going on now with Rivertown. Rivertown has come through now. They, want, they were issued a notice of proposed change to the county um, uh, planning department, uh, which incorporates 15 different changes. They want to move, uh, they want to put a 250 boat dry storage rack building on State Road 13 with boat docks onto the river, a marina in fact, and they want to move a middle school from uh, Longleaf Pine Road to State Road 13. Now tell me, is that a wise thing to do? It's a two lane road, it's high speed, and they want to put a middle school, at, which is also then going to be close to a in, um, um, uh, elementary school that's already been approved. They want five more roundabouts on this street and uh, now this is insane. It will destroy the character of that section of William Barton Scenic Highway which so many people love. So those are not wise things to do but I would, uh, you know, and that's certainly a long way from um, in getting to the county commission uh, but yet it's going to get there, okay, because the developer has the quote right to do that. It's been approved 10 years ago for goodness gracious, okay? That development, now they're coming back with 15 different changes <coughs> to the uh, original order. Well, you know what? We have a comprehensive plan and we need to stick with that comprehensive plan. And if, uh, the, every time we, uh, uh, that is our supposed blueprint for development in St. John's County, okay? And, and, but yet it keeps getting amended, it keeps getting changes, there's waivers. And that really has to stop, and that's what I want to bring to St. Charles County. And I want to be the voice for the people of St. Charles County in trying to stop these types of things that are occurring. Well, let's do this. Um, we'll give you a chance just to respond to that, and then we'll get into some of the questions that will dive deeper in some of the issues that you yeah. both presented in your introductions. Is that fair? Certainly. So if you, do you have anything you want to respond to? Uh, with what he just said, or not at this time? I have, okay. Yeah, I, I, that's actually the next question. Before we do, yeah. I want to remind people watching this that this particular race will be decided in the primary. Correct. I mean, it, it, probably the others will as well because of write-ins, but this one actually will. So yeah. this is important. But so I'm going to ask you, and, and I think you may have just answered it. So I'm going to let you go with this one. And you can go back on it. Okay. We're asking one question of all, uh, all three, all six of the. Commission candidates, and it's that it seems it seems as if developers now they, they buy the property, they know they buy it eyes wide open. There are a few doe-eyed developers, very few of them around, and they and they buy it. We can look at um, the watermark or anything that you want to out here, 
Does the county have some sort of responsibility to maximize the profitability of developments? Do do they, they, they come in, they want, just for example, any development with four houses per acre, and that's that's what the land use regulations are, and the comprehensive plan says this is an area for residential growth, not commercial, and they're come in, such as uh, one just recently in 206 did, with 50-foot lots, three-story homes. Um, does the county have some sort of obligation, or should the developer know what he bought and perhaps ask for more but is it something that the county has to do or or well i I'm think sorry. i heard you say does the county have the obligation to maximize the profits of, devel of a developer mm -hmm. no we don't have that obligation the individuals whether it's a single family residential home vacant lot for commercial development or anything else the buyer has the responsibility to do their due diligence to understand what is possible to be built on that piece of property. The proverbial buying a piece of swamp land exists. It may not be swamp land, it may be based on the configuration of a lot and its location. Although it has the permit rights to build something on it, it may not be possible due to the design configurations. Now that being said, we're a dynamic community. A significant percentage of our community moves in and within five years moves out and other people move in. The demands of the population, residents and property owners, changes over time. And that's why we have the ability to modify land use maps, comprehensive plans, and zoning. We also have mandates from the state and federal government that we have to comply with, which requires us to modify our land development code, among many other regulations. The modifications, while some may be at the request of a property owner, others are due to the mandate to maintain compliance with regulations outside of our control. So the state mandates you to change land use regulations? Yes, the fire marshal's code is a good example. We've had several changes to our land development code recently that are required to our local code in order to comply with state and federal codes. I can see that with fire department, but that wouldn't that wouldn't necessarily allow ex excess growth or extra growth or extra density or or commercial where commercial wasn't allowed. I mean, I, I understand that. Okay. To your okay. point regarding pick residential development, mm -hmm. at some time people wanted larger lots with smaller homes on them, more elbow room between the homes, mm -hmm. and that's what people were buying. Today, people are telling us that people prefer smaller lots with a larger home on it. And I say us, meaning just the general population. Mm -hmm. In general, overall, I would never try to set up an online interview. I don't know how to do that. I leave that up to you guys as the experts. I would never try to perform surgery. I leave that up to the doctor. I, re I re request as a commissioner to have experts in every field that we have purview over as a county or government. And I have to rely on those experts to tell us what we can and cannot do legally first. So I know which items I can and cannot say yes and no to. As a commissioner, I can say yes or no to any agenda item, but that doesn't mean that it's legally defensible. If we don't know what we can and cannot do in our capacities as commissioners, we can get sued and we lose, and then the population pays for those legal, legal fees. So we have a responsibility to know what our abilities to, to do and to serve the public are first and foremost. Then we have to listen to the population and say, what is it the population wants? Because the northern part of our county has a certain density doesn't mean the entire county should have that density. Because St. Augustine is a tourist mecca for, for Florida doesn't mean the entire county should be a tourist mecca for Florida or the world. Each part of our county has very unique qualities, as I mentioned before. And when we make decisions as a commission, changes to our policies, our land development codes, or approve agenda items, we're making those decisions that affect the entire county. It doesn't just affect the population immediately around a piece of property, it has a ripple effect. So we have to take that into account. If the population in general says that they want to live in a larger home on a smaller piece of property, then it's our responsibility to represent the population. If the population says we want fewer homes with more elbow room between them, then that's our responsibility. We're supposed to represent the population, not a specific group. We rely on other individuals to explain to us 
not just how we can legally perform it, but why we should do it. Is it in the best interest of the community? Does it serve the needs? Is it sustainable? There's a lot of different moving parts. It's not just simply the density of a development in any given in part of our county. You know, from the point of view of uh, the profitability of a developer, as you originally asked uh, Jim, the fact of the matter is, no, we don't owe that to them, okay? But the fact of the matter is that, of course, their objective is to maximize the profit on any piece of property that they buy. So, and that's their objective when they go to the county commission with a development plan. I mean, as you pointed out, 40 foot lots, 50 foot, 60, 70, 80, okay? Each one of those lots uh, adds to the, to the density of a community. In fact, there's one uh, being considered for development now called Bocage, okay? The fact is they originally came with asking for 540 homes on uh, State Road 13, right near State Road 16, regardless of the fact that that is a heavily traveled road uh, and the traffic situation is horrible. Okay, uh, the, the citizens of St. John's, that part of the area came to us, the Scenic Highway. What can we do about it? Uh, we advise them that, you know, what we really need to do is understand what the comprehensive plan uh, is all about and what they can or cannot protest. Well, okay, so we went to, we had a meeting with the developer, the developer says, uh, well, you know, maybe we can reduce that. So they did, the 480, but guess what? They, they then went to the school district and the 50 acres that they were vacating, uh, they were, were going to put homes there. They suggested that, and they offered the property to the school district. So now, makes sense. Okay, now we got 480 homes with a uh, middle school on State Road 13. So we're back to the same problem, density and traffic. And so, uh, uh, and then we finally came back to the developer and said, uh, let's do 100 homes. That's probably, that's the most we think we, this part of the roadway will sustain. While he's still mulling that over, likelihood is he won't because his attitude is, most developers' attitude, that they want more density, put more homes in a given uh, area. From a marketing point of view, do people want single family, I'm sorry, single story or multi-story uh, properties? Do they want less property or, uh, or more property? I think if you went out and took a poll, you'd find that most people would like a little more property them being able to stand in their backyard and touch their, touch their neighbor's house, okay, uh, being. And so those are the issues. The, 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 uh, and it's up to the county commission to begin to, and in fact, when we look at the growth management laws as far as the state is concerned, after Governor Scott got uh, elected, what was his uh, mes message, okay? Florida's open for business. He then gutted the DCA, Department of Community Affairs, which actually looked at development plans that were sent to them by the county commission, reviewed those plans, and made changes based on the, the current market trends and what is good for the community. That was DCA. That was totally, the, that department was disbanded and was then lift, left up to the county commissioners. And if you look at the language of law, which I have done, it says it's optional, okay, the county commission in making changes to the comprehensive plan, the land development codes, it is option to the county commission, okay, so, the ca and in fact, in discussions with uh, Jeff Smith, the fact of the matter is, uh, each county commissioner has a lot of latitude when he's looking at a committee, com and a development request, and in fact, when you look at a development request that's in front of the county commission, they have two choices, okay, for or against. And so it's easy to pick the one that you want or you think you wish you favor, uh, whether it's a reject or accept the development. And, and that goes on all the time. I think the commission, commissioners need to have a lot more common sense on how this affects and <coughs> impacts the, the uh, people of St. John's County. You know, currently we're at 223,000 or more people. In 15 years, it's predicted we'll have 340,000 people. What's happening with the roads? Where's the road construction? Where's the road, road repairs? Where's the bridge construction? How are people going to get out of St. John's County if there's any type of a storm? And in fact, if you look at it, it's been statistically stated that 80% of career employed people work in Duval County. So, uh, and, and that means all that traffic in morning and evening are going in the same general direction. And that impacts all the citizens of St. Johns County. It takes people that live in the State Road 16 and 13 area, it used to take them half 45 minutes to get to work, now it takes them an hour and a half. 
you know, we get 335,000 more people, uh, a total of 335,000 people, and we haven't changed or improved the infrastructure, guess what? We're going to have three-hour waits to get to their jobs in Jacksonville. And, uh, and the same thing happens uh, uh, with pu public transportation. People are aging in place in St. John's County because they love St. John's County. But they but as they get older, they don't wish to drive anymore. We don't have any amenities on the Northwest, for instance, uh, like doctors or, or, or quality restaurants or, or, or even places of entertainment. They have to go to Jacksonville. So, so we need public transportation. We need road improvements. We need park improvements. We need uh, more green spaces for people in St. John's County. That's what they moved here for. So you know what? They moved here because of the quality of life. They're going to be moving out pretty soon if we don't make some changes. And that's what I would like to bring to St. John's County. You, you're bringing up, you, you're sort of coming into what I want to talk about next. Um, I know that the County Commission did not get the chance to vote on a sales tax. Commission or the people? The commission did not did not get a chance to put the sales tax to the people okay. because of this and that. But given everyone's sort of agreement that we're behind on infrastructure and stuff, I don't want to know whether I want to vote the infrastructure. I don't know whether you would like to put it to the people on referendum. I would like to know if you going into this year would support a sales tax, not support putting on a referendum to let the voters decide, but would you support a half cent sales tax for infrastructure backlogs? I don't bring my personal preferences as a commissioner to the board. I don't bring a specific demographic position or a minority's vocal group position to the board. I want to hear from the entire county and represent the entire county. If the entire county or the majority of the county wants a sales tax, then that's the direction that I will go in. I'm not here to represent my personal preferences or a small demographic as to what their preferences are. I want to represent the majority of the people in our county. Based on what was provided last year, I encourage people to call me, email me, let me know what their preference is. Do they want the sales tax even on the ballot? And when the people responded, I said, thank you for letting me know you do or do not want it on the ballot. Why do you want it on the ballot or why do you not want it on the ballot? That was the most surprising part. The majority of the people, close to 90% of the people, the reasons that they wanted it on the ballot or not on the ballot would not have would not have materialized. And that was a concern that I saw as a county government. We did not properly market the intentions of the funds. We received a list of proposed uses, but it was not clear to the public how many of those would actually materialize or when. A lot of the concerns people had by not putting it on the ballot did not materialize. So we wanted to make sure that what we present as a government to our community is what they understand that they are getting or not getting as a result of picket, a sales tax, a fee, or whatever it may be that we're changing in our policy. We have got to make sure that we clearly convey to the people we represent the results of the actions that we take on their behalf. And that did not happen last year. Okay. You know, personal preference as far as taxes? No, no one has a personal preference to raise taxes, but yet there are, and as far as you know, my saying, let's raise the tax by 1%, no, I'm not going to say that. What I'm going to say is the county has other options for, for taxes uh, or increasing and getting additional revenue, let's put it that way. But one of those is the gas option tax, which uh, St. John's County has the option for, which is a five cent tax, okay? On um, gasoline, well, uh, guess what? All the other counties around us are taking that five cent gas tax, okay? But we haven't. This is supposedly an option that the county, uh, our county commissioners have uh, avoided up to this point in time, but yet it's a significant amount of ca money, uh, revenue that would be very helpful to the county. So, is that something we should be looking at? Absolutely. Now, uh, the question is, uh, well, what are the people going to say about this uh, raising the gas tax? Well, uh, a lot depends on how it impacts them at the gas pump. Okay. Well, my opinion, from a marketing point of view, is it may not impact them at all because you know someone like Gate Corporation and others are the price leaders. Okay. So. Uh, uh, let's say in the northwest St. John's County, they're getting $2.18 in Duval County. They're getting $2.18 in St. John's County. So guess what? There's an additional, they're getting, taking that five cent as additional profit from my point of view. And so now is that 
Uh, so if we increased that gas tax by five cents, would it go up to 223 or would it stay at whatever the gate sets the market price at? So those are things we have to consider. Should we uh, make a study of it? Well, maybe we should, okay? Well, uh, something we can take up on the Board of County Commissioners. We have the bed tax uh, as far as the Tourist Council is concerned. Now, granted, they are specifically for certain items uh, within the county, like recreation and like parks, and like the gas tax would be roads. So that helps a lot. Now, do we need uh, sales taxes? Well, that's something that I think, we, again, and I hate to say study because it costs county money every time, but uh, we know that Mike Wanchek had it very well pegged and evaluated as to why we needed the money, and it needed to be uh, a referendum because all taxes related to it uh, should be a referendum. And the same thing applies to uh, uh, the ad valorem taxes. Now everyone's against obviously increasing taxes, but yet, you know, uh, when you really get down to it, Tallahassee also dictates what our problems are financially. Um, they pass laws that affect our schools. They pass laws that affect the county's ability to raise revenues. And so, you know, and that has to stop. And then from my point of view, I believe, well, I, can't, I don't know if we can stop it, but I believe uh, our county commissioner should have a direct line into not only our state legisl or our legislative delegation, but we ought to have direct contact with other legislators in uh, the Tallahassee so that we can present our point of view and present it as adamantly as possible because we have the number one school district in all of uh, the Florida. We have to keep it that way, but yet we're lacking schools or school space, and uh, that all goes back to the business of concurrency. You know, you continue with development, you, know, you, you lack concurrency. And uh, the, with concurrency then brings a thing called um, uh, a proportionate fair share. Well, proportionate fair share never pays for the impacts that it's creating in a specific location. That proportion of fair share money that the county collects goes to correct, uh, fix other problems that maybe are delinquent in getting fixed. So, you know, it's just a whole bailiwick wicked things. And I believe it requires a full-time commissioner, and I will be a full-time commissioner and a voice for the citizens of St. John's. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, obviously, almost every conversation to be had in the county uh, is at least against the backdrop of growth and development. Um, is there, are there any issues that you think maybe have fallen by the wayside that you would like to address? Well, um, well you know, one of them, of course, is I believe public transportation, which uh, I believe you know the county really has to look at. Uh, for, seriously, because you know, where we're at up in northwest St. John's County, <clears throat> we are actually part of the Jacksonville urbanized area. As such, we, uh, we can uh, get bus equipment from JTA, okay, because it's all federally funded, but we can't run the buses unless St. John's County uh, puts in uh, the money for operations. And so this is something that really has to be uh, considered. The same thing applies to um, uh, low-cost housing. Where is low-cost housing? You know, recently uh, Nocatee, which is a fine community, uh, but they had 50 acres or so uh, set aside as a requirement, I believe, by the federal government for um, um, uh, low-income housing. They have recently come to the county commission asking to reduce that to 10, so that, okay, and, and the county did approve that. Okay, and so what happens now with low-income housing? I mean, this is something that really has to be considered. The <coughs> same thing for uh, our, our senior community. We have to consider those folks as well. Again, aging, and uh, they need, uh, you know, transportation to doctors and that kind of thing. And we know that um, the um, uh, Sunshine Bus Company doesn't cover there. In fact, other than St. Augustine and St. John's, the, the, the bus company does not cover any other area of St. John's County. You know, if we're growing to 325,000 people in the, la in the next 15 years, then we sure as heck better get something going there. We have a tremendous veterans population in our county. And while with the progress that's made with, at the federal level with addressing those needs, it's not come to fruition yet. All of the needs are not yet being met. 
and we need to continue to keep that in the forefront. With the idea of population growth and infrastructure needs, the conversation about veterans' needs and our elderly needs are always a necessity in our county. I've not seen them publicized as much, but that doesn't mean that those needs have lessened in our county. That demographic of our county paid a tremendous price to provide us the quality of life and the freedoms that we enjoy and take for granted often on a daily basis. We need to continue to maintain the services to respond to their needs, to pay back for the service that they've given to our country. Right. And the county is looking at, in looking now at increasing the bed tax mm -hmm. countywide. Do either of you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, by increasing the bed tax, I think it was 1%. Uh, um, and my understanding is we are the lowest in bed taxes around this Florida. And so I think it's appropriate to look at it seriously and uh, increase the bed tax. It does uh, uh, provide an additional revenue, which can be used very well in, in, in fixing other issues related to tourism, beach parking and, uh, and things of like that, which is the other issue too. You know, people come to St. John's County because they want, well, first of all, scenic and it's historic, but they come here, when they come here, coming to Florida, the question is always, did you go to the beach? They want to go to the beach. And the fact of the matter is, beach parking is at a serious premium and that needs to be fixed. And that's where some of the bed tax uh, would be used as well, including uh, the pier, which is, is apparently in danger of eventually falling into the ocean, that needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. When it comes to things like bed tax or veteran services, I rely on the experts. I've contacted Mr. Bill Dudley and others in veteran services to better understand not just what the needs are, but how to address them. When it comes to a bed tax, I talk to the Tourist Development Council. I talk to owners of properties that are affected by the bed tax, and I ask them do we need the additional sales tax? What does it do to your businesses? What does it do to the council? What does it do to the budget of the TDT? And solidly, they came together individually and said, we do not need the additional tax. I have to rely on the experts to know how to guide specific avenues of resources. They said that what they have done over multiple years, it doesn't happen overnight, is to garner a reputation as a quality organization with experts in their field that provides the service that they are responsible for providing. And they said that they can do that without the additional tax, that they can address the ripple effect of the benefits of having so many tourists, because you, you bring the tourists in, good job, you've done that, but what's the experience once they get here? Are they able to freely move around? Do they have a good experience and they go back and tell people that they would bring their friends the next time or not? We need to make sure that the, the residual benefits to bringing those tourists here is met and they said that they can do that. They have given me a promise that while it has not been on the forefront that they agree to meet and we'll address those items. It does take time, but we want the community's involvement so that we have a beneficial impact. We don't just raise taxes because we need more money for something and throw money at it. It's the people that make the difference in St. John's County. That holds true for our school system, that holds true for our sheriff's office, for our EMS services, for our library system. It's the individuals. It's not how much money per student you spend. It's not how long that you take to do something. It's involving the entire organization of experts in that field that gives us all the number one qualities that we have. Okay, can, can I add something out too? Sure. Uh, the idea of uh, communications with the general public uh, is something that I don't think we've touched on yet today. And the fact is, uh, that is uh, exactly, uh, that we really need a lot more of that. We need, as far as I'm concerned, um, uh, public, uh, a lot more public input at uh, the county level. Okay, I mean, you look at when we have a, a, a community um, a meeting at the BCC, uh, the general public stands up and they get three minutes and they're out. Okay, I mean, and that and it's almost never waived, uh, except if you're a organization leader, you may have ten minutes. And so, but but more than that, I believe, uh, and as a commissioner, I would. Uh, establish, uh, um, um, uh, how would I say, uh, public, op not public opinion, but I would try to establish uh, a, a group of people that would be considered advisors, at least uh, in District 1, so that when a, uh, something comes up that's of concern to the community, that we, including a new subdivision or a request for development, that we sit down with and, and has, have those advi advisory committee 
give their opinion of that particular development and uh, which would aid the commission. Now that committee of advisory panel would not obviously make decisions. It's entirely up to the county commission. But you need more community input. And I've encouraged people over time that, you know, if you've got a problem and a concern, call your commissioner, go meet with your commissioner, meet with Mike Wansley, meet with Patrick McCormick, meet with anybody you want to at the county because you're paying their salary. And uh, we need also, and in fact, if you look at the um, uh, Volano Beach newspaper uh, this past week, uh, they've got an education pa a panel in the <coughs> newspaper about what all of these, uh, what a comprehensive plan means and what a uh, land development code is and, uh, and what the densities mean and what the zoning uh, uh, ca um, categories mean. Okay, well that's something that the county should have, I believe, on the website so that people can actually find it quickly and, and they can do that on a regular basis. And in addition to that, uh, it would seem to me that um, um, we can do workshops around the county, and one in each and every district, um, maybe every eight or ten weeks, and bring county staff out to uh, be at those meetings, including having a county commissioner there, to explain to the folks what uh, these uh, but all these plans mean and what the uh, uh, land use codes mean and so forth so that they have a better understanding. Now we're not going to get everybody there but at least if we have the community leaders, I know if there was a workshop in Northwest St. John's County related to the development codes, I would be there and I would encourage other people in my group to be there. So I think that's something that needs to be considered. Communications with the general public gives them a better voice in St. John's County and uh, I, I believe the, uh, and, well, the, the politics of St. John's County. Get them more involved. If they get more involved, then we can get more things accomplished as a community. Ginger, do you think there's enough uh, citizen engagement having served on board, uh, I believe, 15 months now? We have over two dozen advisory boards and committees that are populated by residents of our community. There's an application process so that not just anybody shows up and says, I want to be on the board. And every one of these are available to the public to attend. They don't have to be a board member to participate. They're open, they, they set their times and days so that they don't overlap so people can attend any one or more. We encourage people to participate in these organizations because it's the only way that we can continue to be number one in so many organizations. We currently have multiple vacancies on these boards and make a request from the county commission's uh, meetings to encourage people to apply to participate. There's public announcements when the deadlines are for submittals so that people know when they are available to actually attend the board. We accept applications year round so that people don't get caught in a short timeline. We have Shadco with our Sheriff's Office that's been in operation for over 10 years. That's an advisory board that provides information to the community and it meets in multiple different districts within our community. So how much more open we can be and how many more boards we can have, I don't know. We are not perfect. There is always room for improvement. Our IT facilities provide the website and it is light years ahead of where it was just five years ago. There are things that can be improved on it and we are regularly accepting recommendations for how to do so. We want to be judicious in how we spend money on things like that because we don't want to make a change every other day based on a couple of comments. But we take into aggregate what the general population sees as a need for accessibility to information, and we make those changes as efficiently as we can, as quickly as we can. So if there's any other opportunities that people have ideas for more communication, more transparency, by all means, let us know. All of the commissioner's email addresses and cell phone numbers are on our website. I've encouraged people many times to call me, email me, let me know what's important to you, whether it's an agenda item, an idea, or why is it that this happens the way it is. I don't claim to have all the answers. That's why we have close to 1,200 employees that have expertise far better than I, do, I have. But I do my best to find an accurate answer quickly so I can get it back to the people who have those questions. I uh, usually wind up with asking you guys each to tell us, is there any question that we didn't ask you that you'd like to comment on or wrap up? I, I'm sure I have one. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I, I, I guess based on uh, Jimmy's uh, last uh, remark, or should I say Commissioner John's last remark, okay, the fact of the matter is, I believe we need to have a lot more creativity on the Board of County Commissioners. And I know Mike Watchick does a nice job, okay, and he seems to handle most of the problems uh, quite expeditiously, but I believe it's also up to the county commissioners to come up with ideas and present them uh, to, to Mike and in fact present them to the general public uh, for their uh, thoughts uh, and you know my primary and I've been in the commu radio communication business for years I've also been very much involved in writing newspaper columns and things of that nature and over time I think I've refined some of my techniques on how best to convey to the general public some ideas and thoughts and I believe uh, that what's, that's the kind of thing we need also at a county commission level uh, and again bringing you know the whole world today is communication right it's electronic it's uh, you know everyone's got a cell phone and, uh, and so people are more attuned to getting information electronically uh, we at the county need to be I think a lot more proactive uh, and creative in bringing that to the, to our general public it should not be too extremely costly but uh, there is a cost involved it's important for people to know what actually is going on in their government. Well, first, again, thank you for your time. <coughs> thank you for the opportunity to provide this information to the public. I hope that a lot of people are watching so that they can make an informed decision before they vote. I think that we, as I mentioned before, have come light years ahead of where we are now in many different areas. There are rooms, room for improvement. The majority of the agenda items, whether they are policy changes, changes to our code, developments or what have you quality of life questions don't originate from the board they originate from these advisory committees and these organizations they come to any different group that vet the details all you see from the board is a summary a final review and a decision to move forward or not move forward that's just a very short snippet of all of the hours that have spent often by volunteers within our community to vet these ideas to bring together experts in specific fields to say okay we've got an idea is this something that would be beneficial to the greater community and how do we make it happen they come together they bring those ideas together they work out the logistics and they bring a path forward to the, the legal side to make sure we can do it they bring it to the board to make sure that we are in agreement that it's going to be in the greatest good for the entire community and then we move forward with it I think that we can continue to improve that process uh, as far as anything else that should be brought up. I just hope that people would take into consideration the time that it takes for things to happen within the county government. Get involved wherever you can, where you have time, whether it's in person or online. We have quite a few openings for employment in our county. And people are quick to throw stones until they fill those shoes and have to catch the stones and deal with them. Mm. Uh, not saying that questions should never be asked. Absolutely. We are a capitalist society, free market. Freedom of speech is fantastic. I don't think any of that should ever be squelched, but we certainly need a fair back and forth. And I'd like people to be as educated and involved as, impos as possible within our county to continue to be number one in so many different aspects. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you.